That's what I wanted. Good. Hello. Welcome to this morning's seminar. Let's see if I can change screen. There you go. Welcome to the Festival of Better Ideas, our audaciously named uh, series of talks that's been going on all this week and next week uh, to showcase the students of the RCA service design course and our amazing partners as we are today. My name is Clive Grinier. I'm the head of service design at Royal College of Art and I'm the fairly new uh, head of course here taking over from the founder Nick De Leon, who founded this course for those of you who are new to service design um, about eight or nine years ago this is the seventh cohort of students who have graduated seems incredible that we've only had seven because every every year that cohort of students has gone on and they have transformed the world around them they've gone in into business they've gone into government they've gone into local authorities they've gone into charities and they've made the world a little bit different. We currently have 140 students across our two years master's course. And I like to describe them as providing the antidote to a world that is full of technology that nobody's quite sure if they want or like how it works. And poor services that aren't really designed. They tend to be more accidental. And as a result, they damage our expectations and our trust. We are an optimistic bunch of people who are using creativity and human-centered design to make the world better. My first day back in September, we had real people and I was in front of them. And you can see, uh, get a sense of the diversity of international students we have from the Americas through Europe to the Far East, and also diversity in terms of discipline. We have digital designers, product designers, architects, people from the social sciences, people from management consultancies uh, and beyond incredibly diverse bunch of people who are now mostly experiencing each other through Zoom. And this was our students on their final exam day when they imagined their convocation in the Albert Hall. Sadly, is not going to be happening for quite a while and there will be no throwing of the mortarboard hat just yet. It has, for obvious reasons, been an incredible few months. Uh, not what I was expecting when I joined the course, but the students have responded magnificently. They've showed great resilience and courage. They've mastered the digital tools of Miro and mural whiteboarding and digital post-its have replaced actual post-its. And they've continued to reach out to communities on social media, the media to do their research, to prototype and validate their creative ideas, their better ideas. And as well as dealing with all this current, current issues we've had, they continue to look to the future. They continue to look to the core ideas behind service design. How do we harness humanity into technology? How do we create more equal societies? How do we look after the planet? These are the things that, that are important to them, are important to us. This has been a really special year. They're really special students. They're ready to make an impact on the world. Our show this year is entirely online for the first time ever. The RCA 2020 show uh, showcases the work of 850 graduates from the Royal College of Art across all disciplines from fine art to fashion and textiles and back to service design. And if you go on the RCA 2020 site and you navigate from the menu to the School of Design, you'll find service design in there and you'll see collections of projects uh, allocated to students. Now, some of our projects are teams. Some of the teams are quite large. So you might see the same title, in this case, Across Silos, which is the project we're looking at today. That's because we have Amelia and Somia, uh, same project, but two independent students. So you get the whole, um, the whole menu of student work. In addition, we have our own website, rcaservicedesign.com. There's exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, and in that, uh, you can find more background work into the projects and also themes. So we have uh, categorized each of our projects into themes such as human conditions, which is society and culture. See if I can make that move. We have a number of projects around climate change, uh, change of behavior, change of manufacturing, identifying businesses in climate change. We have a number of financial service projects from green investments to money for 
uh, people in vulnerable circumstances. We have a category of urban living that covers um, uh, creating food from unloved, farming for food on unloved plots of land in cities, to looking after data, to encouraging communities to be more resilient and travel to work in a more environmental way. We have category around the future of work. And finally, we have a category around living well, aspects of healthcare from healthy diet to coping in flat shares in a time in pandemic and building trust um, in people who live in accommodation in urban environments. The students described themselves when I came at the beginning of the course as a bunch of words that I felt were very powerful. So we created a visual language for these words. You couldn't be a service designer if you weren't curious, courageous, and collaborative. The students are dynamic, innovative, and transformative. They're not here to leave alone. They're here to make change. And they're hugely people-centric, human-centric, and increasingly planet-centric, realizing that the ecosystem we're part of is not just about man, it's about other things as well. And you'll see in every project when you go on that website, a tremendous sense of purpose, as you will in the project that we're talking about today. So thank you for listening to my little introduction. Um, I hope, I encourage you to go and look at both the RCA 2020 and rcaservicedesign.com. On our own website, rcaservice.com, you can make an appointment with any student, with any project. And uh, if, if you email me or anybody or email the student, they can give you access to their Zoom information and you can have a conversation with them straight away. I encourage you to do so. It's the closest thing we can do to a physical show. Um, so thanks for listening to that. And it's my great delight to hand back to Amelia and Somya, who are the two students who created the fabulous project across silos with their amazing partner, Barking and Dagenham. Uh, and I'd like them to take you through their project and the seminar today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Amelia and Sombia. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Clive. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming and thank you, Clive, for your introduction and support. So, yes, I'm Amelia and Sombia is joining with us today as well. So, our final project, as Clive mentioned, here at the RCA was in partnership with the London Board of Barking and Dagenham. So as service design students, we always hear how service design draws from various disciplines and data science and behavioral science being some of them. So that's why we decided to organize this session today. So yeah, we are really happy to hear from, from Pianunt and Team Pairs for the like next kind of 30 minutes or so. And uh, we will hear about how they apply their practices of data science and behavioral science in the London borough of Barking and Dagenham, and also how service design could add value to their practice. Uh, yes, and after we hear the wonderful talk, um, Emilia and I will be talking briefly about our project across silos uh, and sort of reflecting on how our practice brought added value, uh, as well as a few learnings from working with the local government. Um, we'll then open up a discussion with Tim and PA and uh, yeah, questions from the audience. So um, yeah, if you could just hand over to PA and Tim, who will be sharing their screen and um, yeah, speaking to us for the next 30 minutes. Hi PA, hi Tim. Hello, uh, I'm just going to share hi. the screen. Can you all see that? Yep. Great. Uh, well, good morning everyone. I'll, I'll put that into... Um, large slideshow. Uh, good morning everyone, my, my name is Pierre and we've got Tim uh, on, on the video as well. Um, I am the Head of Insight and Innovation at the London Borough of Barking Dagenham and, and Tim is our uh, Behavioural Science Lead uh, in the team. Um, the team has been around um, for just over three years now and um, we are uh, we use a blend of um, disciplines um, to tackle some of the most kind of complex problems uh, that we have and face in the borough. Um, and I just thought uh, I'd do a very quick kind of whistle stop tour uh, to give some context of, of Barking Dagenham and, and why the issues that we've been um, working on are, are so pertinent. Um, so this is Barking Dagenham, it's uh, East London, um, uh, local authority uh, are on the kind of Thames uh, corridor 
a uh, population of 212,000 people uh, and growing. Uh, in fact, it's had one of the largest population growths uh, over the past 10 years in comparison to the rest of London. Um, we are also facing um, a lot of social and environmental and economic issues uh, in, in the borough, um, according to the index of multiple deprivation. Um, last year, we are uh, one of the poorest um, uh, boroughs in uh, in London uh, and one of the most deprived places in the UK. Um, high unemployment rates and high domestic violence rates, uh, just just to name two of the uh, two, two of the, the key issues. Um, recently, yes. we have had an increase. Yes, yeah, sorry. I think are you? Uh, I think we can't see the other. Slide. Yeah, we're we're still on slide one, Pierre. Yeah. Ah on the pink slide okay. that's better now we are on the second one okay sorry do you want to full screen it okay. yeah yeah and it's on full screen perfect it's, yeah is that fine okay yeah. great sorry thanks um and um so uh, yeah so that's uh, uh barking dagenham um we have during lockdown uh because of the socio-economic uh, environment of our 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 borough and our population, we have, for example, had um, over 133% increase of people claiming uh, universal credit um, and other unemployment benefits just during lockdown. So there's a disproportionate impact uh, of, of COVID on, on our population in, in that sense. Um, are you now seeing a slide that says Fordism and post-Fordism? Yeah, okay, great. So. Um, uh, many students and others may have heard about uh, Fordism, this uh, sort of modern economic uh, social system, um, and um, you might read about it in lots of textbooks. For us in, in Barking Dagenham, we, we mean that very literally, because um, mm. uh, if you own a Ford vehicle, it is very likely to have been built in uh, Dagenham uh, in our borough. Um, and to put this in context, um, 30 years ago, um, uh, the there there were over forty thousand uh, uh, residents who worked in Dagenham Motors. Uh, today there are less than two thousand. So we have had uh, in the history of our borough uh, the um, uh, collapse of a really large economic um, provider for many residents. Um, needless to say, we've got some game-changing challenges, um, including. Um, uh, what you see here, uh, uh, which is our kind of borough manifesto, our 20 year vision, um, there are 32 London boroughs. Um, and when we started uh, in 2017, uh, and when this team started in 2017, uh, you can see that actually we were underperforming or at the bottom of the league table on many of those um, indicators. Um, and we've been doing our best to um, help shift uh, the dial uh, on a number of those things um, and as you can see at the end of 2019 we began to improve uh, on some of those indicators. Um, uh, some of those things you'll hear about uh, today in particular case studies that have contributed to that um, and uh, we continue to um, as I said tackle some really complex um, issues. Um, in 2018, the council uh, kind of uh, restructured itself uh, and uh, Tim and I work um, in uh, the core of the council and um, where data and insight um, is at its heart. Um, a little bit about the team, I think a lot of people seem to think that uh, we're a bit like a bunch of geeks in a basement um, uh, with lots of stickers and whilst um, uh, we definitely do have lots of stickers, as you can see by my laptop here. Um, we like to not to think of ourselves as um, the folk on the left, um, but more so um, like uh, Indiana Jones, who famously said that, um, uh, you know, 20% uh, uh, of um, uh, archaeology is actually in the library and the other 80% is out in the field. Um, so um, that is kind of our approach to things. You're, that's not a picture of Harrison Ford there, that is in fact uh, Tim Pierce. Um, and um, uh, this is a slide that uh, our chief exec uh, quite often likes to use because 
Um, we are uh, in modern days grappling with the balance between um, science and intimacy. So science from uh, the kind of manifestation of science is, is pretty much in, in, in our team in that we are able to use uh, data and technology and uh, you know quite advanced analytics to do some um, uh, intervention work um, but ultimately these are um, uh, the lives of uh, many vulnerable residents um, so there is a um, uh, important balance there um, to make sure that we get that right um, and this is our overall um, uh, kind of uh, uh, sort of approach as a team um, so we uh, usually get fed kind of strategy or problems uh, from um, across the organization uh, we use a lot of data science techniques to um, build, build evidence do projections predictions uh, Tim is our expert at um, uh, trial and intervention design as well as uh, using creating uh, more behaviorally informed interventions uh, we've been doing some service design work as well and I've put uh, media and Somia's pictures there so you you know where uh, uh, they kind of sit in this spectrum of our work uh, and that is ultimately to to deal with um, you know uh, improved uh, uh, processes and outcomes for our residents. So what is data science? Um, well, uh, data science is essentially uh, advanced analytical capability through a combination of, of, of kind of computer science, uh, mathematics, um, algorithmic design, so on and so forth. Um, but for me, none of that actually matters uh, until you have the things that are on the right hand side of that slide there. So um, uh, until we have domain and subject matter expertise in the problems that we're trying to solve and we intend to act upon them we can do as much data science as you like um, but it's not going to make a difference and henceforth our mission statement as a team uh, and the uh, the title of this um, slide deck as you may have seen is, is turning data into insight-led action uh, and hopefully we'll be talking about some of those little case studies as well I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, one view which might be mentioned a bit later. One view is our um, uh, predictive analytics platform. Uh, it does a whole bunch of machine learning and we feed data across uh, adults, children's housing um, uh, and revs and bends uh, into our platform to look at um, uh, vulnerability and um, stratify risk uh, across our population. Uh, and this is a tool that um, uh, I think uh, Mili and Sony might, might touch on a bit later in, our, in the kind of blended uh, element of this presentation. Um, so what does it do? It brings together predictive models, it automates case notes, um, we, can, we can do various intervention analytics. Importantly on the top right there, um, we have been using the partner information portal with schools and uh, when Amelia and Somia speak uh, about their project, this is where um, that has been deployed. Um, one example of, of an outcome was we essentially used uh, OneView to identify um, areas with very high um, levels of deprivation, high unemployment. Uh, and the service that was designed there was a community food club. And the way that that works is a resident um, actually pays £3.50 but they get £20 worth of shopping and in the remaining um, kind of money that they've uh, cost avoided or saved uh, we help them put, the, put it into kind of financial plans to, to pay off debt um, and um, in one of the clubs uh, we've been working with five, 50 families uh, and, um, and uh, managed to save over £300,000 into statutory homelessness duty so uh, and because that model is so successful, there are now um, three food clubs in the borough. Um, we've been using data science to uh, reduce homelessness um, in our Homes and Money Hub, uh, where we've targeted um, residents who need financial support. Um, and um, this has led to some really impressive outcomes. Um, so we've prevented 134 um, uh, families from becoming homeless an 81% decrease in evictions and a 12% reduction in, in, in um, uh, new temporary accommodation uh, and that is quite a substantial sum of money there that um, we have saved. Um, the way that OneView works in this case is 
um, it, uh, it basically tracks a series of triggers that looks at when, when someone, one of our residents is in a, in a sense of financial distress. Um, and uh, where we use behavioral sciences, um, and, in, and this is an example of one of Tim's messaging, is to kind of nudge those residents to come into the Homes and Money Hub um, before they get into quite severe and acute need. Um, so uh, we have been able to um, help um, in this particular case a lady called Jane who exhibits some of those characteristics there um, and help her um, get a new job and um, be on the right uh, welfare support um, so she didn't go uh, she didn't become homeless um, and one view is as I said um, uh, applied across multiple domains and it's used by almost 400 staff uh, in the organization so whilst uh, the Insight Hub is a small team. Um, we're able to operationalize a lot of our, our tools for uh, our brilliant frontline staff. And I'm going to stop here um, and bring Tim into the conversation. Oops. Tim, just let me know when. Great. Switch Great. On. Great. Thanks a lot, Pierre. Um, hi, everyone. So, yeah. Um, I think I was introducing myself at the billing bars on mute, so I'm not sure if anyone got that, but yeah, my name is Tim Pierce. I'm the behavior science lead um, uh, at uh, Barking Dagenham, and um, I work closely with um, Amelia and Samia on their, on their project. Um, but um, we thought we'd, before getting onto that, kind of talk a little bit about what behavioral science is as a sort of, um, to help people kind of think about um, what it is and, and what it means. So um, yeah, Pierre, if you could click, that'd be great. Um, so in, I've, I've, there's lots of different frameworks. It's a, it's a rather new discipline, but I think um, one helpful framework to think about um, what it is, um, is that um, we have kind of two different modes of thinking. Uh, we have a, a system one, which is fast, automatic and effortless. So if I ask you what two times two is, you instantly know it's four. You've not done any sort of mental effort to get there. Um, but similarly, if you're walking home from the train station, it's, it's no mental effort, effort. You could be thinking about something else entirely and your system one will, um, will get you home. So um, system two, on the other hand, is a different mode of thinking, is um, slow and effortful um, and you know, requires work. So if I ask you what is 27 times 14, you need to kind of sit down and engage um, your brain in that. Same as if you're creating a presentation for a job interview or something like that, it requires um, hard work and, and effort. Pierre, if you'd skip, that'd be great. Um, so um, that works, that, those two systems um, have evolved and works brilliantly lots of the time. So lots of our kind of easier decisions are devolved to system one. So making quick automatic decisions about things we know um, and preserving our brain power and power for kind of like more difficult things. Um, but it can lead to predictable um, errors in our thinking. So sometimes we're using system one at a time when it's actually better to be using um, system two. So behavioral science is all about um, understanding um, the, you know, the use of system one when it's used um, incorrectly and how to kind of you know, push people into system two or how to help people to use their system one more effectively. Um, I'm gonna give you lots of concrete examples in a minute, don't worry. So, um, but one of the main, um, main things to, to draw out of it is that I guess a kind of a really kind of, I guess old fashioned view of decision making is that you kind of weigh up the costs and benefits of a decision and, and do whatever is right. And um, what behavioral science says on the other hand is that actually the, um, the, the environment in which you take your decision um, is also really important. And that's because part of the time you're in system one and system one will be picking up cues and making automatic decisions. And a lot of those will be um, context dependent. Okay, PA, next one. So um, I also think it's kind of worth to try out the difference between behavioral science and normal government work. So basically um, you might say to me that, but, well, hang on, change of behavior, that's what government does, right? So what's, how's this different? And you would be right, that is what government does. And the difference is that government um, relies on some kind of traditional um, methods, which are really great for loads of things. Um, but, but the thing that joins them together is that they change people's incentives. So for example, you make a law and you say, if you drive 150 miles per hour on the motorway, you know, we will put you in prison. And so because people don't want to go to prison, they don't um, take that behavior. 
same with taxation you know we don't want you to to smoke so we'll just you'll just have to pay twice as much as it should cost and again it changes the behavior but what you're doing there is you're changing people's um incentives behavioral science is different it doesn't try to change people's incentives it more focuses on the environment in which a decision is taken changes that and, and actually also gets to a different decision so just to give you a really easy example if you put things um at eye level on supermarket shelves they are more likely to be bought it's not because they're better it's because they're at eye level and it's and it's le and it's easier to to pick them up they attract your attention quicker all that kind of stuff so that's a very basic example and um what we're doing in bark and dagenham is trying to apply that to public services so yeah next slide please please okay that'd be brilliant so what i'm going to do um for the last bit of my um presentation is just talk you through a framework that's been developed by the behavioral insights team called um east it stands for make it easy attractive social and timely um and that's the things you need to do if you want to encourage behavior so i'll give you a bit of theory on each of those and a bit and a practical example either from what we've been doing or from what um, the work from the work of um, BIT where I, where I used to work so I, I know the examples better cool okay next one all right so first one is uh, make it easy so um, this one sort of sounds obvious but I think the, the, cr the crux of this is that it's it's more powerful than you first expect so if we're communicating with people are we are we um, communicating in a simple and direct way right so how, how often do you get letters from the government that are three pages long and you've got through the first one you still don't know what it asks of you you know that that's a real problem you're going to lose people they're not going to do what you need them to do um, removing friction so anything that imposes a barrier on a behavior in, is friction and you see this all the time for example if you want to unsubscribe to certain things there's all sorts of little barriers we have to put in your email address your name you know your, your grandmother's cat's name all these little frictions which kind of prevent behavior well there's also the reverse of that is to strip that friction out um, of, of um, doing a behavior, making it easy to encourage it. Finally is defaults, which is about what happens if people do not choose. What's the default option? What, what will happen if, if um, people don't specify um, what they want to do? All right, next one, Pierre. So I'll give you a quick example of what we're doing in Bark and Dagenham to make it easy. Um, this is about health checks. And so um, uh, at um, age um, 50, I believe, you are eligible for an NHS health check. It, it um, checks various um, uh, kind of like measures of your, of your health and tells you if you are at risk of things like um, cholesterol or heart disease. Um, and the way that traditionally works is um, you might get a letter um, or the GP might call you. But it's not very systematic um, and um, as usual you know letters are not the best way of communicating with some people so we are we're, we're working with um, a startup called apt health and we're basically making the whole book the way the whole way to book your appointment really easy so for a start texting people um, and within that text we are including appointment slots so it's two-way messaging so that very quickly you can say oh yeah tuesday at 10 and words um, and and sort of book it right there and then if none of the three slots we offer you work you can ask for more but basically within the space of um a couple of minutes and um, you can have a have an appointment booked rather than getting a letter through the post having to read it having to call your gp half the time they won't answer because they're too busy all that kind of stuff right so um we are in the current of tr uh, we're currently in the process of trying this but we expect this to lead to greater uptake of um, health checks and therefore um, uh, better health uh, in our borough. Next slide, Pim. So that was make it easy. Second one is make it attractive. So this is very um, well done in the private sector. Um, every time you walk into the shop, there's lots of things we wanna buy. And the question for us is how to, can we apply this to public services? And um, I guess kind of like three ways to think about it is firstly, attract attention. Are you are people noticing what you want them to do um, secondly personalization so we are more likely to um, pay attention to something or engage with something if it's personalized that could be as simple as having a name at the top of a letter um, but it can also be thinking more about well what is this person's circumstances and how do we change a service um, so that it's it's more of a personalized service um, and finally the use of rewards and incentive um again people think differently about being rewarded people value different things um you know um there's all sorts of ways that um people kind of value um 
kind of being remunerated and it's just worth thinking beyond the kind of traditional um ways of like the sort of money and, and that kind of thing all right next slide Cool. So just a quick example from the Behavioural Insights team here. So um, you may have received one of these messages, but um, essentially the, 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 the work was to try and reduce missed hospital appointments. So about one in 10 um, hospital appointments is missed uh, in the UK, which, uh, which causes a pretty significant cost to the NHS. And so we thought, well, you know, can we, can we change um, that text message to encourage attendance? And so um, we, uh, sorry, I say we because I used to work there, but sorry, the Behavioural Insights team um, trialled um, three different messages against the normal message. And um, one of them was kind of a uh, kind of um, make it um, easy, um, a make it easy message. So, the, so it sort of included the phone number to call if you wanted to cancel your appointment. Um, so make it easy to cancel. Here's the number, just hit it and you can cancel it. Um, number two built on that. So it included the phone number. Um, but also included a social norm. So I'll come on to social um, norms in a minute, but essentially we are quite, um, um, uh, well, we are more, we are likely to follow a, a crowd if we believe that crowd is like us as part of our in-group. So this one um, included um, a social norm, which is that nine out of 10 people attend. So the, the vast majority of the people attend. And then the final one was um, costs to the NHS. So again, we included the phone number it's for easy cancellation, but um, but we also sort of flagged the cost of the NHS. So the, the thinking here was that um, a lot of people in the UK feel very strongly and warmly about the NHS um, and flagging up the costs to the NHS um, may um, drive a different behavior and therefore and get people to basically cancel their appointments. Okay, next one. Um, great. And so what was found was that, um, as you can see, so lower is better on this scale. So the original you can see is at roughly 11%. Um, each of the messages was better. Um, interestingly, the social norm did not seem to offer anything over and above just making it easy, which was providing the phone number. But actually the NHS message um, was the best of all. Um, and so in this case, the use of, of of the NHS work better than telling everyone that most people did this. So I think one of the interesting things about this is sort of testing it. Um, there's, there's no real theory on which one is more likely to work. We know all of them have a good evidence base. And so um, one interesting thing about behavioral sciences um, is testing stuff to find out what works. Next one, please, Jay. Okay, third one is make it social. So I just mentioned it but it's basically we are impacted by what others around us are doing. So this is about social norms. So I just mentioned one, telling people what other people are doing um, can change that behavior. Messenger effect. So we, are, we respond differently to information depending on who it comes from. So, you know, an extreme, you can imagine something being said by a political party you do not like. Um, if that exact same thing was said by a political party you do like, you might feel quite differently towards it. So how do we kind of harness that in our in our public service messaging? Um, and thirdly is reciprocity and commitment. So this is about if we if someone does something for us, we feel um, like we'd like to do something back. Um, equally, um, making a commitment to someone, we're more likely to follow through on that. Uh, next one, please, Jay. So really, really quick example from the from the Behavioural Insights team. So this is about collection of counts. And what was tested was basically a social norm in a council tax letter and the social norm basically said 96% of Medway council tax is paid on time you're currently in the very small minority of people who have not paid us yet so it's, it's a sentence in a letter the question is does that get people to pay their tax Pierre if you could switch um, and interestingly it does right so all of this the fines all the, all the threat of fines in prison gets you a certain part of the way but then including some behavioral science get, gets you a little bit further. And, and that's kind of some of the interesting things about when, when and where to use behavioral science. All right, next one. So final one um, is make it timely. So this is about we respond differently to kind of in, um, information when it, um, depending on when it comes. Um, so um, that means it's kind of interesting to prompt people. Um, how do you prompt people to make a decision and when? Um, how do you help people to plan to make a decision or follow through on a decision? And finally, how do you factor in the fact that 
um, anything that's far off, it, the costs and benefits feel much smaller, whereas anything close, they feel much higher. Uh, okay, next one, Pierre. So Pierre alluded to this in the, in the beginning, but, um, but we worked in our kind of homes and money hub, which is a kind of, it does a lot of things, but it does advise people on, on debt. And we, we are trying to move to a proactive debt advice um, approach. So currently what happens is, is kind of people kind of walk in and say, can you help me? What we want to do is use data science and one view to target the people we think most need this and then engage with them. And what we had been doing was sending them a letter. And it's not a terrible letter, but it's a letter and it's a council letter. And basically no one was getting back to us on the base of that letter. So we thought, well, let's make it easy. Let's make it timely. When people go into council tax debt or social rent arrears, let's drop them a text and say, look, we noticed that you went into arrears. Um, we have a free service from the council to help you with think about debt money. Would you like an appointment um, and a call back? And again, people were, we got uptake rates of between 30 and 50% on that. And, and people coming in who were, who would, for example, didn't even know they were eligible for housing benefit and yet they were getting into deep debt. So really able to help them. And it shows the power of behavioral science combined with, with, with data science. Okay, fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. Next one. So that's the last one. So, so this is the last one. So just, um, yeah. So just a few things to take away. Um, uh, so firstly, people usually do things for good reasons. Um, but sometimes um, we as designers of services do not think carefully enough about the drivers of behavior. Um, a crucial part of thinking about this is the, t the exact time and place where a decision will be taken. And um, it's always worth thinking about um, uh, the sort of grain of human behavior when making decisions. So, um, so that's it for me. I just wanted to say very quickly that some of this will overlap very strongly and feel very familiar to service designers. Um, and some of it won't and and that's why it's been so fantastic to have um, Amelia and Samia um, with us and I think we're going to talk a bit more about um, how they've worked and, and helped us um, in a minute but I'll stop there and hand over to them we can have a discussion a bit later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you NPA and Tim for this fantastic talk. Um, so we've heard uh, about the wonders of data science and behavioral science. Um, and Emilia and I will now take you through uh, a little bit of service design and how we sort of worked with uh, the London Borough of Barking Dagenham. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, yep. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, looking good. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, okay, so we're going to briefly share our project across silos, which we did uh, with the Barking and Dagenham Council on developing joined up approaches in local government. Uh, we've been working with them for the past six months and it has been an incredible journey, um, which we are very happy to share with you today. And we're just gonna run through really quickly uh, with what we did. Okay, so um, we started off with this enormous challenge of understanding how we can support uh, children and families at risk better in order to prevent child neglect. And this is a priority of the council comprising 46% of child protection issues in the borough. If not addressed, we all know that um, there's a high risk of the, uh, to the child to end up in social care, resulting in negative consequences into adulthood as well. And in its most simplistic sense, there are two stages to support vulnerable children and families um, early on, which is to detect it early by identifying children and families at risk, and second, providing the right support to families through appropriate services. And we were completely new to this challenging context and took these two factors as our starting point and therefore worked very closely with uh, primary schools who are at the forefront of identifying children at risk and frontline workers who deliver services to children and families. And this being such a multifaceted issue, we were part of an ecosystem of um, the Inside and Innovation Hub with PA and Tim, um, primary schools, public services, commissioners, um, just to name a few. And we engaged with them, uh, with all of them, through a collaborative process. Uh, some of you might know what this is. <laughs> uh, starting with uh, discovering barriers in the system through qualitative research, uh, going on to define and prioritize problems to tackle from a whole ocean of problems uh, by evidencing it with research. Uh, then developing solution collaboratively with experts in the field, uh, and then delivering through multiple rounds of prototyping and testing. And through our research, what we basically found was that there was a lack of joined up approaches between all of these practitioners in the system who uh, need to work together for shared outcomes. 
and we observed recurring patterns of information deficit and lack of communication channels in pretty much three key moments of supporting children at risk. Um, so identifying needs, activating support and receiving feedback. Just to give you a few examples uh, of the barriers that we identified. So signs of neglect um, aren't detected early enough. Uh, there's a lot of crucial information of children and families, both with schools and the council, which is not shared with each other. Safeguarding teams in schools are not aware of services they could refer to, resulting in more than half of the referrals coming in from schools uh, being inappropriate or incomplete. And moreover, there's a lack of feedback loops after making referrals, which leave practitioners feeling lost to continue supporting children and families. So um, basically, we set out to enable collaboration between schools, public services and the council through effective information and communication flows, which would then allow all of these actors to provide support to uh, families early, quickly and more effectively. And yes, so turning our vision into reality, we created three interventions that sit uh, in those three moments we talked about before. And the interventions enable uh, you know, knowledge transfer and improve uh, the flow of information and communication to facilitate uh, these joined up approaches. Yeah, so yeah, the first intervention is the partner information portal, which allows the council to share uh, to securely share um, information on children and families at risk to school staff so they can better identify needs and support the children. So the information consists of current and past service involvement and any immediate risks. So the portal filters only relevant information from an existing software, which is OneView and that was shown uh, to you by PA and is used by the Council, as Pia was mentioning, to collect citizens' data from across uh, social care, housing, uh, etc. Uh, the second intervention is the interactive service guidance, which is a set of tools that enable practitioners to quickly identify needs of family and activate appropriate services to support them. So we, we won't go into all of them now, but yes, one of the examples is uh, the service landscape, which, uh, which provides an up-to-date and easy to navigate list of services, combining public, voluntary and community services in the borough based on needs and level of risk of families. Uh, the third intervention is a new feedback and handover process, which enables services to give feedback to practitioners for referrals made. So it explains clearly uh, why a referral was rejected, um, rejected, gives guidance and instruction on what to do next, and if required, redirects to ca uh, the case to other more appropriate services. So uh, all of these interventions are being tested, uh, tested in the borough through different levels of fidelity in order to create um, an evidence base of what works and what doesn't. Uh, some of them are currently being piloted and the rest being developed to pilot. So uh, while we were testing those interventions, we saw also other services and agencies in the borough becoming interested in developing them as well. And uh, that's because the barriers we identify are inherent, are inherent to other public sector agencies as well. Uh, so we develop across silos service patterns, which is a pattern library that provides a set of tested tools and guidance to enable join up approaches and sharing of information between agencies. So the library is designed to be used by service development teams in the council and we are also keen to explore if it could trigger change in other uh, local authorities as well. So it collects 11 patterns, they are organized into uh, four main categories which are uh, get or give access to citizen data, orient practitioners to navigate the local offer, uh, provide information about the service and uh, redirect a case to, a more, to more appropriate services. The patterns can be adopted and combined as per the need and uh, co they come with instruction and templates that bring them to life. So we won't get into the details of the library now, but it's, uh, it's currently live if you would like to have a look. Uh, it's a work in progress, but yes, just please feel free to explore it. So the implementation of the intervention is still underway and through those learnings, we have been continuously informing and strengthening uh, the patterns compiled in the library as well and uh, the interventions will enable school and services to get in much earlier to support vulnerable children. It will reduce inappropriate referrals, reduce time taken to activate support and escalation to statutory services as well, and ultimately prevent adverse outcomes for families. 
So yeah, that was an overview of our project and we would like to conclude with some of the approaches that we use and which ended up being helpful for this project. Also keeping in mind the strange uh, times that we were working in. So uh, yeah, the first one, uh, so based on feedback, we received uh, a high level of engagement from stakeholders, which uh, can be attributed to the collaborative nature of the service design process. And also because of creating shared ownership by surfacing multiple perspectives. So yeah, the second one, given the re remote working circumstances, it was key to use digital, but at the same time, inclusive tools. Therefore, for conducting uh, remote research, workshops and prototyping, we use uh, low tech collaborative methods so that we could cater to a wide range of audiences. Uh, also choosing from uh, a diverse range of potential ideas and solutions, we then evaluated them with stakeholders and started with quick wins to create a precedent and get buy-in for longer term interventions. And yeah, we also followed an hypothesis-led approach that enabled us to be iterative, test things quickly and build evidence of what works and what doesn't. Uh, yes, uh, and we created solutions that were embedded in existing channels of working to make use of available resources, avoid big learning curves and also to increase uh, the ease of implementation. We added our approaches by complementing the other capabilities already present. So it was really interesting to see how our three approaches merged together during the project and produced robust insights and stronger solutions. Um, so our methodologies were essentially different ways of producing insights. For, for instance, during research, service design would surface user-centered insights based on needs and motivations of the people involved and behavioral science would challenge that to understand recurring patterns of behavior or even to dig deeper to understand if respondents actually mean what they say. Uh, so that was just one example. And those were just some of our reflections. And yeah, we'd love to open up to a discussion now that that was, that was all from our side. So thank you for listening. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes. Um, so I guess, um, you know, while we wait for maybe questions to come in, I could maybe ask a question to PA and Tim that's uh, sort of been on our minds uh, as we're working with, with you. Um, so the question is, um, what do you think are some of the opportunities of service design in the public sector? Uh, maybe something that you observe during our project or maybe something that, um, you know, that, that, that you're aware of? And maybe you could also touch on um, not, just, not just opportunities, but also limitations that you think service design has. That's quite controversial, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so um, Samia, the, the, the question is opportunities and limitations of service design. Yes, in the public sector. Yeah, in the public sector. Okay, so sh I'll start just because Pierre hasn't said anything yet. So, um, but, and, and I guess I was closest to the, the, the project than you guys. So, um, I thought so, um, and I've referred this to you guys already, but one of, one of the things I thought was incredibly powerful was the way um, um, this felt very kind of bottom up and generated kind of um, insights and problem definitions from frontline workers who knew them the best. So one thing we see a lot in, in councils is, um, you know, people dropping in consultants, experts, making suggestions, dropping a, a PowerPoint or a report on our desk and leaving. And as soon as that gets anywhere near the front line or um, even sort of service managers, they're just like, oh, this won't work for all of these reasons. And regardless if there is, um, of whether there is a good idea in there somewhere, because it, it hasn't landed, it doesn't go anywhere. But I thought what was really great about this work is that we started um, with the, 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 ser um, the services, the service users, the service managers, and built up the propositions so that by the time we had um, a PowerPoint deck, which um, we've just presented, um, with full of great ideas, um, all the people who were who would need to implement it if we wanted to do it were like, "Yeah, no, this is great. This is this is what we've been saying all along." And um, for our directors, that's just very refreshing because normally, then you know, you can get into that internal battle. We want to do this, or we want to do this, but this approach was um, uh, just that sort of that that process. The, the kind of the, the double diamond, getting people in, um, narrowing it down, expanding it out, challenging, I thought was, was really, was, was brilliant, basically. 
thank you. Can I can I just come in on on the sort of limitations bit actually, since that Tim answered the first bit. Um, I I think one important thing to recognise is that um, particularly in local authority, but not not just local authority, but particularly in in this case where um, you know we're talking about vulnerable children here. Um, you know, one of the um, challenges always uh, when we're working in social care is that um, finding the right balance between what is our statutory duties as a local authority and what is what is in legislation of which what we have to do and um, uh, what is the level of as and you know the the slide that I use there and, and use the term intimacy uh, on on kind of um, how how much of an intervention uh, do we want to deploy uh, with vulnerable people and and there is always that uh, that challenge because there are things which we can do uh, and we are legally obliged to do and then there is always an ethical dimension um, that we as um, designers of of systems need to think about uh, in terms of how do um, the how does the end user uh, react so for example um, you know all of the cases that um, people saw there were about kind of frontline staff so uh, frontline interventions um, and uh, you know the blended approach of data science behavioral science and, and service design is always going to throw up um, uh, specific uh, challenges on, the, on each and every single case because um, you know are we are we intervening with the right people at the right time um, have have the have the statutory triggers been um, uh, you know have we have we triggered a statutory duty all of those things so it's it's a complex um, uh, legal uh, system that we operate in and that's I think one of the reasons why um, sometimes deploying these uh, tools is is can be a bit of a challenge so that's my thoughts on that. I've also just realized that there's lots of people um, asking questions in the chat um, should we answer that or should I just chat back or oh yeah I think it would be like nice also to answer to some of the questions yeah sure um, so there's one for me from um, Caroline um, one view has an MDM layer to it but it, it isn't it isn't a um, complete MDM system so essentially what we're doing is m mirroring what is in line of business systems and we're taking out data from liquid logic and flare and things like that to to model uh, do some forecasting work analytical work outside of those line of business systems so that we can come up with cohorts of um, residents that we can do some work on and one view is co uh, to, I don't know, one view is the system built by a team um, so uh, it's co-designed so um, we we have we purchased a uh, the technology platform from a private provider but the modeling work and the dashboard work and uh, the kind of um, understanding of cohorts is, is done by our team. So it's a blended approach. I'm not sure. If that, I think that was all the questions. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, there is another yeah. question from um, yeah. Jeffrey as well. So yeah, love, love how much you guys build on system already existing in Barking and Dagenham. Uh, wondering how feasible it would be to apply your ideas and if the council has any plans to do that. Um, so, uh, as I said um, earlier, the, the most important thing is action and we don't, we don't really embark upon things uh, where we don't apply anything. So um, all of those um, ideas um, either have already been applied or um, are currently in the process of being applied. Um, yeah, we, we we try not to get involved in things just for um, uh, you know uh, theoretical uh, endeavors. <laughs> um, in terms of insights, do you use as one from Ash the Johri? Uh, in terms of insights, do you use the existing insights to build your own research or only validated them? If they're opposing insights, which ones do you prioritize? Um, 
I think, I think we we actually built our own research from in this particular project i think it was probably our own um validated certainly from a from a domain or subject matter expertise level yes sorry somi i think you were going to say something no 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 i think yeah i think you answered it but yeah um for this project definitely i think it started off with uh, research with primary schools and frontline workers mainly because you know, as we said that uh, child neglect is the, the 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 people who are looking at these children and who are able to identify these children um are primary school staff so it was really important um to speak to them first and sort of uh, we went through a whole um, prioritizing process with uh, the stakeholders involved number one because uh, we needed to understand in terms of timeline what can be done and understand what are the priorities of the council uh, so they could um, you know because we are working collaboratively and uh, yeah it was it was i think a mix of uh, impact versus effort yeah i agree and it i think yeah i think it was also like really important to kind of uh, yeah build our own research and speaking with um, like all the stakeholders uh, separately at, at at the beginning and then uh, bring them together uh, for example in like co-creation workshops and like validation sessions and prototyping so okay, Amog. Amog is asking, um, can you talk more about how educators interact with the service you have built? Um, I guess maybe probably he means like schools. Yeah. 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 Uh, so like in primary school, there are there there are um, teams that are called safeguarding teams. So they are um, they they are the people that have the duty to like um, assure the like be sure that uh, not just about like from the educational point of view, but they need to check also on the entire kind of health and well-being of the child. So all of the interventions that uh, that we that we shown are uh, mainly like using by these teams. So uh, they 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 uh, the interaction the like the engagement uh, with them like we engage that's why we engage them from the beginning, and they uh, like have access to. Uh, to all of these tools for uh, basically be more equipped to um, uh, deal with the uh, with the issues that they are facing on a daily basis. Yes, and uh, I, I think yeah. it's just important to mention there as well that this particular project around childhood neglect and things came from a um, a review done in the borough about um, exclusions. Um, so. Basically, this review said that um, when when sort of when pe when I guess teenagers um, get excluded from school, quite often um, there are triggers which we and behaviours which we would have known about during primary school. So that's why this um, this project was was um, deployed, if you like, in in three primary schools as a as a pilot to see if we can actually do uh, the prevention of um, uh, certain um, issues that lead to uh, exclusion in the in later years. Yeah, thank you uh, for clarifying that. I think yeah. So as I was asking a uh, interesting question, I hope I pronounce the name correctly. So have frontline social workers using these tools come back to you about functionalities that don't work for them or contextual information or practice wisdom that can't be captured by these tools. Have you managed to make any changes based on this bottom-up feed feedback after implementation? Yeah, like definitely. Uh, the process was extremely like collaborative and iterative. So we keep like changing like the forms or like the tools that some like the tools that we show to you, um, like really based on feedback from like different frontline uh, workers. So even if they like might work in the same uh, for the same public services service, for example, they might have like different, uh, different opinions and, um, and positions. So it was like, we use those, uh, we really use those uh, as a, also as a conversation tools at the beginning and change, completely change and iterate them. I don't know if someone wants to add. Uh, I think you, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's always um, interesting with with social workers who are really at the acute end of 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 uh, understanding need is that 
you know the important thing is that they we cater to to their requirements so um what we're trying to do from even from a you know mentioning one view as well what we're trying to do from that angle is is um we're, we're not asking we're certainly not asking um, you know any systems to make any decisions on behalf of of social workers but we're we're basically sitting with social workers to understand what is the the, the, the level of information and detail that they need um, almost instantaneously um, that will help them to to get to some decisions decisions quicker and also share that with uh, multidisciplinary or, and even multi-agency um, frontline workers so um, uh, those are those are kind of constant issues that we're always um, uh, trying to to tackle um, the next question is from Martin. Martin. I guess it's to you and uh, Tim as well. So given COVID and the signs of not being uh, given indeed of the relationships with experts, how would you reflect on your recent events on your data-driven work? Um, so we've been uh, even busier because uh, I think the lock lockdown has showed that um, you know, the importance of data, data accuracy and data timeliness um, and, and getting to um, residents, vulnerable residents quickly is, is so important. And I think one, uh, one, one thing that I will say is, um, you know, we've had data sharing agreements with our, with our health partners for several years. And before we went into lockdown, when the government started hinting at lockdown, um, within a space of a day, we were we were able to analyze um, uh, the number of people who um, uh, were were likely to be shielding uh, because they have a, um, a, a long term health condition, and we enacted. Uh, once we did that piece of analysis we enacted a a, um, a sort of community-led response um, uh, with the several volunteers and um, uh, charity groups in the in the borough to support with you know medicine delivery and food parcels and so on and so forth and and, and one thing that i should leave you with on that point is the importance of having that data in the first place um, was that uh, when the confirmed data on people who were shielding um, came through. So we had to wait several weeks for the government to send us um, the confirmed data on, on who, who, who's shielding. Um, we, in our own kind of local insight and pa partnership work with, with our health partners, had already kind of accurately predicted 99% of the people who were going to need to be shielding. So when that list came through, um, uh, it validated for us that um, our analysis was was good, but also our local, importantly, our, our local response to that, which is not so much about me or Tim and, and others in the team, but it's about how, how does that insight enable um, people on the ground to to act so that so that that's kind of been uh my my sort of reflection on on that um yeah i'll hand um probably back to you Somia, on the next question yeah um from bruce it says how much did the lack of face-to-face -face interaction due to covid limit your research and ability to test the new service did zoom work for you yes definitely not zoom but um teams yes but more than anything i think it was the it was just Hangouts and Google Slides because there are firewalls in schools and there are, uh, you know, the council has, the council has firewalls as well where a lot of, uh, you know, these high tech collaborative tools can't be used. Like we as service designers use like Mural and Miro, all of these things. But it was really, um, it was really important to see how we can do the whole process in a very low fidelity way because a process is, it has so much to do with collaboration and like workshops where you bring people together and uh, sort of facilitate discussions. Um, so it was really important to go low tech and it did limit, um, it did limit our interactions, but it, no, actually I, I take that back. I think it increased our interactions with people because um, there were a lot more people who were willing to engage with us. And I, and I feel like uh, one thing 
uh, one thing why that happened is because of uh, you know ease of accessibility so just um, scheduling a call and just like getting on a call with 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 so many different stakeholders from like all over the system so i think it it helped us in a way i think the next question from uh, Dr. Sunil Singh must be a relative of Somia. That's my dad. <laughs> oh, uh, hello, Dr. Singh. Your daughter's done very well. Um, uh, and congratulations to her. So um, voluntary disclosure. Um, uh, this is kind of like a data protection question. Um, and, and actually, uh, when we work with, um, uh, you know, children and families that at, at, at point of assessment, there is a... Um, um you know we we, we essentially ask uh, for their consent um with, without doing so we wouldn't be able to continue with with all of those things um we also worked with the individual schools to make sure that um they have up to date uh, kind of privacy notices uh, that are published so that um you know parents are aware that in certain um statutory circumstances um uh, we share data with um, social care teams and, and, and across the system. Okay, I think the next question is from Asta, which is very interesting. Uh, this is for Tim and PA. How was your experience working with two service design students as external consultants to the project? And what would be your advice to graduating students who want to work with councils on similar problem areas, collaborating with data and behavioral science teams? Tim? Sorry, so I was on mute. Um, um, so I think um, I think service designers could offer huge value to councils. Um, the, the the gap is that it's sort of it's still not as well understood as you might think. And so I think one of the big things is is how you demonstrate value. And I think a lot of um, data scientists, behavioral scientists, service designers, you name it, um, can come in with their big fancy ideas and start talking about all the amazing things they have done and their disciplines can do without first kind of listening to what um, are the priorities of that organization. Um, now, you know, service designers are probably better than that than most, but I think there is something really important about understanding um, the needs of each council is different um, they're similar in some ways but they're different so there is something about what are those issues that they're facing and and and, and what can service design do to to support that um, so so that's that and then in terms of working with intel teams it's about um, the kind of the process um, you guys bring and the uh, you know the, the benefits of um, kind of getting everyone together to sort of co-design stuff um, and land it um, rather than just sort of going off and doing your work and then presenting kind of a, a, a report or deck of slides um, at the end. Yeah, and I, just to, to kind of add to that as well, one, one thing that is always a bit of a challenge is, is um, um, there, there aren't, across local authority, there aren't lots of data science and behavioural science teams, which is, is something that Tim and I are kind of keen on on working with our sector to to showcase how important this stuff is um and and a, a kind of several pieces of advice i think for graduating students um uh, and um what one is um the, the way that amelia and somia uh kind of approached us was um i think first uh i, I was presenting at a, a, a conference um with with Nesta, the think tank on, on some of our projects a year or two or something like that ago. And um, the, the, they, the guys made an approach um, and you know, sort of introduced themselves and talked a bit about, um, um, you know, what they're interested in. Uh, and so that's kind of always a good thing in, in, in the sense that, you know, uh, for graduating students to network and go to those places where, and conferences where, um, um, you know, th there's speakers who you s you think you can um, collaborate with, um, and and um, uh, you know you know you, you just never know what what might happen, and um, you know that single conversation that evening led to um, this entire project. Um, the second piece of advice I would give is, uh, I, I, and it's just to sort of expand what Tim has already said, but 
particularly in local government, you will find that uh, we publish a lot. And I, I referred earlier to a, um, uh, an independent review done of our schools, for example. Um, Ofsted, every, every uh, local authority has an Ofsted report, um, which will be published. And um, it's important before making an approach to any public service, local gov or not, to understand the context uh, and the policy levers that are in place before you make an approach. Um, so reading an Ofsted report or in, in our case, you know, the Charlie Spencer review on schools, um, to, to look at what were the recommendations that were given to the local authority on how they can improve um, whatever uh, and, and kind of almost open your conversations with with those things because it shows that you've understood the context in which we work in um, and, and it shows going, going back to Clive's very uh, you know good slide on kind of curiosity and collaboration you know it, it shows that um, and so there's a part part of me which is you know, don't just say that you're curious, uh, you know, show that you're curious um, and you know, read the things that we put out there, because a lot of those things that we put out there in the first place are, are there so that, um, you know, in, in the hope that, um, you know, there's some intelligent folk out there that that might have um, uh, an approach to, to, to help answering some of these really complex, multifaceted um, um, issues. Um, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's probably my advice for for um, grads. Can I, um, can I jump in? That's yes, okay. Yes, just, just briefly, and I just wanted to um, to thank you for those comments. Actually, they're incredibly helpful, and actually very helpful to me. Thank you, Pierre. I also want to say um, what how fantastic it's been to have this insight. We very rarely get insight into how these collaborations really work. I really want to thank you, Pia and Tim, for sharing that so candidly and honestly. And I think it's just been absolutely fascinating to see um, to see how your three disciplines do work together. You know, bumps and all, as it were. Yeah. But yeah. I think it is absolutely about collaboration. We've got a lot to learn about what's right for you. And I hope everyone on, in the audience as well has had a good chance to sort of see how this stuff works. I think it has been a fantastic project from Samia and Amelia, but mainly due to your fantastic collaboration. So I just wanted to say thank you very quickly. Oh, uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to, to everyone, really. Uh, um, you know, Amelia and Samia have been working very closely with us. Um, and actually, it's probably really poignant to kind of almost end in answering uh, Shreya's uh, question about the difficulties we face as creative professionals in the public sector. Uh, and and um, I, I think that, um, and we could, I'll, I'll try to be fairly brief on this, but um, I think one of the, 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 the challenges is um, when in, in local authority, and, and this is me coming from, I'm, I'm speaking as a person who's been outside of local authority, has been in startups in tech and consulting and, and, and various different types of facets. And um, is that what I, what I often find in local authority uh, is, um, uh, and I'll, I'll choose an uh, you know, anecdotal um, you know, experience here, but I was not at Barking Dagen, but some, some years ago I was asked to um, look at a service and, and come up with something quite innovative. And I did exactly that and I came back to present to the director who, who, then, asked, who then said to me, okay, this is a really interesting, innovative idea. Um, can you tell me uh, where this has been done before? And, um, and what they mean by that is which, which other council has done this? And I've said, well, your brief to me was think of something creative and innovative. So the answer to your question is no, it's not been done before at all. Uh, and actually what, what um, uh, that, that is a culture that exists and, and a mentality that, that it exists across uh, local government and, um, uh, uh, and public services. And I think one important thing to remember is what that means is it's not so much about being, you know, the, the, you know, the sort of phrase of the early bird, you know, gets the meal. Um, in local gov, it's almost like the, you know, it's not the early bird gets the meal. It's, it's sort of the, the second mouse gets the cheese. And because um, quite, quite often what we're looking for 
is where others have have attempted things but perhaps haven't gone quite so well but there's ways that we can tweak and iterate and and try in a different approach so it's not so much you know about finding a creative solution it's about finding a creative approach to a solution the solution itself may not necessarily be creative it could be really bland and boring but the approach that we take to get to landing that, that is more important. And that's my sort of two cents on that. Tim, did you have any thoughts? Um, uh, no, I think that's, that's, that's exactly right. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't have anything to add on that. That sounds exactly right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Live, can I just ask you, so people are asking if then the recording will be available. Is this going to be available on the service design website? Um, I think it's yet to be decided. We have an incredible collection of events all recorded from this festival of better ideas. We're only at the end of the first week. We've got another week to go. It's crazy. Um, so I think we're going to have to set up, uh, you know, probably uh, a dedicated page with all the um, all the recordings. We've got a few YouTube live streams, so we may put it on YouTube as well, just for ease of access. But we'll make sure we let you all know. Uh, and I think the first port of call would be the RCA service design.com website. You should be able to find some links. Maybe just give us a few days to get all these incredible recordings sorted out and put up there. But we will be, we will be um, giving access to everybody. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I think that's the end of uh, that's the end of this talk. Uh, thank you, P. A. and Tim. It was really insightful. I'm sure everybody uh, learned from you just the way we did as well. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you for your time. And thank you for to Clive as well for. This yes, thank you, Clive. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for everyone who came to join us today. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers, everyone. Well done. Well done. Bye now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>